Hi, welcome to uh, Mathematical Fallacies. These are strange things in, in mathematics that come up, uh, particularly in, in physics. Um, so this is uh, Extraordinary Concepts in Physics. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Robert Nemiroff, a professor at Michigan Technological University, and this class is being taught for credit at Michigan Tech. Um, so you can find us on the web here, search for star, Starship Asterisk and or Physics X, and you can find us uh, on iTunes, just by searching iTunes. And here's the web address if you can read that. Good luck. Okay, so uh, I, one of the things that I find really cool are mathematical fallacies, things that uh, look true in mathematics, but, but turn out to be somehow strange or somehow untrue. So when I teach occasionally uh, mathematical physics uh, to the graduate students at uh, Michigan Tech, I put this particular one on the board and uh, ask if uh, people can understand what's wrong. When I first saw this, I just thought this was the, the funniest and coolest thing. I just thought this was great. So I teach this not only because it's fun, but because uh, when I teach math physics, usually maybe once a semester or so, somebody makes a mistake just like is made in this particular, quote, proof, unquote. And uh, also I've seen some of the other mistakes here. And also, one of the ways I learn is by studying things that interest me. So if I understand the mathematical fallacies, it helps me understand math better. It helps understand the math that underlies the physics better. Now this isn't so, we're not getting into really the deep math here. This is just sort of fun stuff. You just need to know algebra, a little bit complex uh, variables to know this. So it's just fun. So we'll start out with uh, A equals B equal to 1 in this proof. And then we will um, square, we'll multiply both sides by A, which will give us A squared on this side and AB on that side. And now we're going to subtract B squared from both sides. They both get B squared. It's, that's equally fair. Now you might notice that uh, A squared minus B squared can be factored into A plus B, A minus B. You can verify that by multiplying this out. A squared, you know, and the middle ones fall out, and you get uh, A squared minus B squared. The other side, we can just factor B out and get B times A minus B. Okay, now we can cross out the A minus B's and get A plus B is equal to B. And now we can add them up because we said they're equal to 1. And we can show that 2 is equal to 1. So the way this works is that whenever you have any problem due that involves math in physics or, or, or math, you can first show this proof that 1 is equal to 2, then say that any number is equal to any other number, and then put down anything you want for the answer and say that this is mathematically equivalent to the answer to this problem, so I deserve to get full credit. However, your professor might not be so impressed. So it is best to know what's wrong with this. So uh, many times people can guess, and the answer is that there was a step where you took out A minus B from both sides. So when you did that, A minus B is 1 minus 1, and 1 minus 1 is 0. So then you're dividing by 0. Now, sometimes you can get away with dividing by zero, and it doesn't matter. But this is a case in point that many times it does matter. And if you divide by zero, you're really doing a mathematically undefined operation, and just about anything can result. So in fact, two can be equal to one. So the, the moral of the story for people doing, doing lots of algebra in their physics or math is to be careful not to divide by zero. Or if you just can't get the answer, be sure to divide by zero in the middle uh, to get the answer and then, then go toward the answer after that. Here's another one. This is actually probably even more common than the previous one. Uh, this proves that 2 times pi is equal to zero. So first we start out with x equals to 2 pi. Uh, then we're going to take the sine of both sides. So the sine of x is the sine of x. The sine of 2 pi, as we know, is the sine of zero. Uh, so now we're going to take the arc sine of both sides and we get back with x, but now we have on the right side, we have arc sine of 0. Um, therefore, we get that uh, x is equal to 0, because the sine of 0, as we know, is equal to 0. Therefore, the arc sine of 0 is 0, so x is 0. But wait a minute, we first declared that x is equal to 2 pi. Therefore, logically, one can say that 2 pi is equal to 0. So, basically, all of trigonometry is, is meaningless. Uh, geometry is taking a big hit here. However, there is a reason why this doesn't work, and this one might be easier than the other ones. Uh, the arc sine function is multi-valued. So the arc sine of 0 is not necessarily 0. In fact, it could be 2 pi. It's not clear what it is. So if you're doing a physics problem, you might need to find out what range the arc sine function would be. So you need to be careful. This is, arc sine is not the only ones. In fact, when I grade problems, 
Uh, typically, actually, in introductory physics, the tangent function seems to be the big one. And uh, quadrants of the tangent have to be carefully uh, aligned that you don't jump between quadrants. OK, here's one that comes up. x is equal to 1. That's the way a lot of these start. Let's take the, pot, the derivative of both sides with respect to x. d dx is equal to d dx of 1. Well, the d dx of x is just 1. But when you take the derivative of a constant, it's 0. So 1 is equal to 0. What's wrong with that? And the problem here, and actually there are times in physics problems where this is, uh, people get away with this. Um, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. But you can't do that really because x is not a true variable. So you need to keep track of what's really varying and what like pi is not varying. Because you could just take the derivative with respect to pi sometimes and then all hell could break loose. Um, so know your variables from your constants. Okay, uh, partially the root of partial differentiation as well. Moving right along, negative roots. So we'll start with 1 equal to 1. How can that be disputed? Uh, 1 is equal to the square root of 1. We all know that. That's taught in elementary school for the first time you learn squares. So let's break up the 1 here is equal to this 1 equal to minus 1 times minus 1. So now we're having the square root of two things that are multiplied, so we can separate them. So this would be the square root of minus 1, and this would be the square root of minus 1. So then we would have 1 is equal to i, because i is equal to, i is an imaginary number, which is equal to the square root of minus 1. So i times i is minus 1, so that 1 is equal to minus 1. So what's wrong with that? Well, by now you know mathematically is consistent enough to use. So this is a tougher one, and I have to admit, when I looked at this, I didn't immediately uh, get this. This doesn't happen very often in practice. But it turns out that when you take the square root of x and y, uh, to be equal to the square root of, when you break it up into the square root of one times the other, that both numbers must be positive. So sometimes you have to check these little rules, and if it, if it turns out not to be true, then you have to be careful. Okay, infinite series. Infinite series are cool. Uh, most functions can be written as infinite series. Most numbers can be written as infinite series of other numbers. So here we go. One of the simplest infinite series is just declaring that 0 is equal to 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, etc. Well, we can break each 1 up into 1 minus, each 0 up into 1 minus 1, because 1 minus 1, we all know, is 0. So every time you see 0, now replace it with 1 minus 1. So you get a long list of zeros equal to these things. So now, you, we're going to re, regroup. We're going to take this one and break it off, the first one, and we're going to regroup these guys. And then we get that, can't see it very well, 1 plus minus 1 plus, minus 1 plus 1. But it's still that minus 1 plus 1, that 2 is, equal, is also, sorry, have to be careful about using the preposition to here. That also is equal to 0. And so all of these are going to sum to 0. But we're left with this guy out front, which is 1, so that 0 is equal to 1. How about that? Well, I won't quiz you on this one. The associative law cannot be applied to infinite series that are not absolutely convergent. So meaning the sum of the absolute values of each term itself converges. So if you take the absolute value of all these terms, you'll find that it diverges. So another little less known rule you have to be careful with. And coming near the end, this is a little bit, this is actually a more common problem, but the, the way it's demonstrated here uh, is, uh, is more complicated. So uh, you can start with this equation, x squared plus x plus 1 is equal to 0. So then you're going to play around with this, and you're going to move the x plus 1 to the other side, and you get x squared is equal to minus x minus 1, and then you can um, divide by x and get x is equal to minus 1 minus 1 over x, so you divide both sides by x here. And so now you have this equation, which is not really a solution, but you then plug that back into the middle one. That's what's happening. So you get that x squared minus 1 over x is equal to 0, x squared is equal to 1 over x, and x cubed is equal to 1. Therefore, x is equal to 1, because we all know that 1 cubed is equal to 1. So now that we have a solution, we can go take the solution and put it back in the initial equation. And we get that 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 0. But we all know that 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 3. So here we're not just showing that 2 is equal to 1. We're showing that 3 is equal to 0. So 
The question is, what went wrong? This is a little more complicated, but I think many people might already have a guess, and the guess is that the problem is really in this step here. So although x is equal to 1 is only one solution, x cubed is equal to 1 actually has three roots. And it is really the other, at least one of the other roots that is the real solution to the problem. And the x equal to 1 is actually an extraneous solution. Many times you can get a solution in physics and it's called not physical. Because if you put it in, it turns out to be outside the range of what's going on in the problem. Well, sometimes extraneous solutions can be not mathematical as well. They're not even general solutions to the problem. You got off on a different branch of a cube root or even a square root and didn't come back to where you wanted. So the moral of the story is be sure your solution is a real mathematical and physical solution. Otherwise, anything can happen. And with that, I'll wrap up mathematical fallacies and remind you to keep Schrodinger away from your cat. See you next time.